Hey everyone, I am Ms. Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we are going to be learning about barometers in terms of how they work, and we're also going to learn to solve some questions involving barometers. In case you don't know, barometers are devices that are used to measure atmospheric pressure. So we're going to be learning about how barometers are able to measure atmospheric pressure. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of barometers, first of all, we must understand the concept which makes a barometer work. Sucking a straw. My question to you is, why does the liquid go up when we suck a straw? By now, you should kind of know how this works. And I don't mean sucking a straw in real life. I mean using physics concepts to explain how this liquid goes up when we suck a straw. So this has everything to do with the difference of air pressure inside and outside the straw. You see, if the straw is exposed, the air pressure inside the straw is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the straw. Therefore, the air pressure inside and outside the straw are balanced. That's why you'll find that the liquid level, both inside and outside the straw, are the same. But if you were to suck a straw, the air from inside the straw is removed, and this creates a vacuum inside the straw. Even if it's not a vacuum, it still has less air, therefore lesser air pressure. At this point, the atmospheric pressure outside the straw is greater than the air pressure inside the straw. It's no longer balanced. So, the atmospheric pressure would then press on the surface of the liquid, forcing the liquid to rise up the straw, in an attempt to try to balance the pressure both inside and outside the straw. So the liquid will keep rising until that pressure is balanced both inside and outside. This is how a barometer works. The barometers are built on the same principle. In this case, we're not going to be sucking the tube of the barometer. So to mimic that, we will use a closed-ended vacuum tube just like what we can see in this diagram here. So if we get a closed-ended vacuum tube and place it in a liquid, what happens is the atmospheric pressure will press on the surface of that liquid so that the liquid will rise up the vacuum tube, just like how the liquid rises up a straw. So they both work on the same principle. Inside the straw, it's a vacuum or partial vacuum. And inside this tube, it's a vacuum. Now remember that a vacuum here means that there is no air, therefore zero air pressure. This means for sure, the atmospheric pressure outside will be much greater. So the atmospheric pressure will press on the surface of the liquid, forcing the liquid to rise up until the pressure inside and outside are equal. In case you were wondering, how do we create the vacuum on the inside of the tube? Do we have to suck it out or use a vacuum device? No, it's actually very simple. All you need to do is take a closed-ended tube, fill it full of this particular liquid, and then invert it. So what happens is if you were to invert it, if the liquid level were to drop, that creates a vacuum inside the tube because there's absolutely no air. When you fill it full of the liquid, there is no air trapped. So when you invert it, no air, so if the liquid level were to drop, that empty space is actually a vacuum. So that's how you can create your own barometer if you wanted to. Now let us recall about the concept of liquid pressure. If you have not learned about liquid pressure, please watch my video about liquid pressure. Right now, we're just going to do a quick recall. Liquid pressure can be calculated by taking the density times gravitational acceleration times depth or based on the equation, P equals rho g h. So we know that liquid will exert a pressure based on its density, the gravitational acceleration, and its depth. In this case, let's assume the pressure is acting downwards. So within the barometer, what happens is the liquid would rise up until the pressure of the liquid inside the vacuum tube is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the tube. 
the pressure has to be balanced. Otherwise, one side will constantly be fighting. Oh, this is more, this is less, this is more, this is less. So obviously, the liquid is going to rise up until the pressure is balanced and equal on the inside and outside. At that point, ah, equilibrium, stability. So if we could measure the liquid pressure of the liquid column inside the vacuum tube, that would be equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the tube. So this is how this kind of liquid barometer is able to show us the value of the atmospheric pressure. Now remember that when we talk about the height of the liquid inside the barometer, it is measured from surface to surface. That means from the surface of the liquid inside the tube to the surface of the liquid outside the tube because the pressure has to be balanced at the same point. So when the atmospheric pressure is pressing outside, that pressure has to be equal to the pressure that's inside the tube. So we always measure the height from surface to surface. Now, one of the most common liquid barometers used is the mercury barometer. So why mercury? We will be discussing this in a few minutes. For now, let's look at the mercury barometer. If you're wondering, how high does the mercury level rise in the tube? Well, we're going to show you the calculations right now. Given that the atmospheric pressure is about 101,325 pascal, ooh, quite a mouthful there, and the density of mercury is 13,590 kilograms per meter cube, what we can do is we can use the liquid pressure formula. Because if you can recall what we've just discussed, the atmospheric pressure on the outside is equal to the liquid pressure inside the tube because it has to be balanced. Therefore, we can write atmospheric pressure equals to rho g h, where rho g h is the mercury pressure inside the tube. We know that the atmospheric pressure is 101,225, so that's what we'll write on the left hand side. Rho is 13,590, while g is 9.81. We're looking for h. This calculation will give you the h value of 0 0.76 meters. And in fact, in real life, if you were to observe the mercury barometer at sea level, you'll find that the mercury level is at 0 0.76 meters. So this is why we express atmospheric pressure this way. We normally don't express it in meters because 0 0.76 meters is kind of awkward to say. So this value is equal to 76 cm or 760 millimeters. So that's why we commonly write atmospheric pressure as 76 cmHg or 760 mmHg, where Hg is the symbol for the element of mercury. Because of this, cmHg as well as mmHg are accepted units of pressure. Using the lengths of cm or mm is a much easier way of recording the values from the mercury barometer. Because if you were to observe the mercury barometer, all you need to do is take a look. Oh, okay, today is 76 cm. And let's say if you observe tomorrow, oh, it's gone up to 76.2. You can write 76.2 cm Hg. You don't always have to convert it to Pascal. And the only time we do that is if we have to do a question that requires us to write the answer in Pascal. So these are the values that we will find from a mercury barometer. Now, a more common liquid that is found in everyday use, of course, is water. So you might be wondering, why can't we use a water barometer? Well, you can, but let's calculate how high the water level would go. Using the same value of the atmospheric pressure, we can use the same formula of atmospheric pressure equals rho g h. But this time, the density of water is 1,000 kg per meter cube. As you can see from the calculation over here, we'll get the value of H as 10.33 meters. Typically, we would just round this down to 10 meters, and you would find that atmospheric pressure is very commonly written as 10 meters water. By the way, take note that if you were to write the atmospheric pressure using mercury or water, you must write both the length as well as the type of liquid. So if I were just to backtrack to the mercury barometer, that's why we write atmospheric pressure as 76 cm Hg. You must have both the length cm as well as the element Hg or mm Hg. You can't just write the length because if you write 76 cm or 760 mm, 
that's just length. That's not pressure. And if you only write Hg, like 76 Hg, what does that even mean? The values in this case just means that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by 76 centimeters of mercury or 760 millimeters of mercury. Likewise for water, you must write the length and the type of liquid. That means meters water. What this means here is that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by 10 meters of water. If we were to compare the mercury barometer and water barometer, based on the same value of the atmospheric pressure, you can see that the height of the liquids are very different. And this is because the density of the liquids are different. Because density of mercury is much, much greater, therefore its height is much lower. Whereas density of water is much lower, therefore the height of water in the barometer is much higher. So when you look at the liquids from a practical point of view, you can see that mercury is much easier to use because the height is only 76 centimeters. It's less than one meter. Whereas for water, it can go up to 10 meters. And in some cases, that goes up to about three or more stories high. You have to climb a ladder, a very tall ladder at that, just to try to take the reading on the water barometer. So this is why, even though water is more commonly available, we don't use water barometers. So we use mercury barometers because the density of mercury is much higher, therefore its height is much lower. Now, let's take a look at some questions involving barometers. Say we have a mercury barometer like this. The height of the mercury shown is only 720 millimeters. The question is, what is the atmospheric pressure measured by the barometer shown in the diagram? And we need to state the value in both mmHg as well as Pascal. We are given the density of mercury as 13,590 kg per meter cube. To solve A, it's really easy. Just take the value as is from the diagram, which is 720 mmHg. To calculate the value in Pascal, all we need to do is take the liquid pressure formula, which is P equals rho GH. Rho will be the density of mercury, which is 13,590. G, of course, is 9.81. And H is the height of the mercury. And we have to express this value in meters. That's why we write it as 0 0.72. And this gives us a value of 96 kilopascals. Let's try another question. Now we're given the atmospheric pressure as 760 mmHg, and we need to calculate the air pressure in region A in mmHg as well as Pascal. Now, remember, never assume that empty space inside the barometer is a vacuum. The question needs to tell you that it's a vacuum. So if you were to refer to the earlier example that I've shown you, it does state that it's a vacuum on the inside. In this case, they told us that there's actually air inside region A, and we need to figure out how much this is. How do we solve this? Now, remember that the pressure inside the tube must be balanced by the pressure outside the tube. So therefore, we can write it as the atmospheric pressure, which is outside the tube, is equal to the pressure inside region A plus the liquid pressure exerted by the 640 millimeters of mercury. So to calculate the pressure in region A, all we need to do is take the atmospheric pressure, which is 760 mmHg, minus that liquid pressure of 640 millimeters mercury. And this gives us a value of 120 millimeters Hg. To calculate the value in Pascal, we just need to use rho GH again. And then this time, substitute the value of H as 0.12 which is 120 millimeters expressed in meters. And the value here is 16 kilopascals. Now let's look at how aneroid barometers work. Aneroid barometers are much simpler to read than liquid barometers because there's a scale there. All you need to do is look at where the pointer is pointing and take the reading from there directly. Aneroid barometers obviously do not work the same way as liquid barometers. 
Aneroid barometers don't have any liquids. This is what is inside an aneroid barometer. So on the top, there's a pointer, which is connected to a spindle. The spindle is connected to a lever, which surrounds the aneroid cell. The aneroid cell is a circular disc that is labeled in the diagram there, and the aneroid cell has a vacuum chamber on the inside. This diagram shows us the same thing, except it shows us a clearer cross-section. So you can see that the aneroid cell has a vacuum chamber on the inside. It is held in place by the lever, which is connected to the spindle, which controls the movement of the pointer. How it works is like this. The aneroid cell would expand and contract depending on the atmospheric pressure. If the atmospheric pressure decreases, this causes the aneroid cell to expand, whereas if the atmospheric pressure increases, the aneroid cell will contract. This is because inside the aneroid cell is a vacuum chamber. So if the atmospheric pressure is greater, the atmospheric pressure would then press on the aneroid cell to compress the vacuum chamber. Whereas if the atmospheric pressure decreases, the aneroid cell will expand. And this is why the aneroid cell will expand and contract depending on the atmospheric pressure. So the expansion and contraction of the aneroid cell will cause the lever to rise and fall, which in turn makes the spindle turn. And that's why the pointer will rotate and point to the value shown on the scale. So the values on the scale obviously have to be calibrated to where the pointer is pointing, but generally that is how the aneroid barometer works. If you found this video to be educational and helpful, please click like and subscribe for more lessons, solutions, and exam strategies from your physics teacher, Ms. Ho. If you'd like an update on the SPM and IGCSE physics syllabi, please visit my website at physicsrocks.com. Happy studying!